good evening. Welcome, everybody who's here in the space and those of you who are virtual. We, uh, my name is Sue Perdue. I'm the Director of Grants and Fellowships here at Virginia Humanities. And we're really pleased to be in this space um, in downtown Charlottesville with Hunter Shackelford. Um, I want to make sure I got that name right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little jet lagged from the trip, and so I'm, I want to make sure I'm doing everything correctly. But anyway, we are here to, to kind of kick off Hunter's exhibit, which is kind of her work, uh, their work based on uh, the Public Humanities Fellowship, which you are our second group of Public Humanities Fellows in two years' time, and we're really pleased to have you here. And I think you are the first exhibit we've had in this space. The exhibit mm -hmm. is behind us, and those of you who are in the space will have some time afterward to look at the exhibit, and I invite everybody online to come look at this powerful work that's on display at the um, Robert and Joseph Carnell Memorial Foundation exhibit space behind us. We also have food here. We welcome you all to join us who are here after this talk by Hunter to partake and to spend some time in the hallway behind us because this work is not to be missed. Um, without further ado, I think I'm going to kick it off to you, Hunter, and get going um, to talk about Agrolandica. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to present my work. Um, and for those who don't know who I am, um, my name is Sandra Jackson. I'm a of them. I am a multidisciplinary artist, independent scholar, um, which means I move outside of the lens of academia. Dang me. Um, and just an overall death worker. I'm someone who really focuses on death as a lens. Um, to produce work and to talk about the ways that social and identity issues operate in our world, especially a world that is designed by anti-blackness. So I'm really excited to present my work tonight, Afrolantica, uh, Virginia's Fugitive Legacies. I also wanted to honor uh, Derek Bell, um, where I um, took this name from the book Afrolantica Legacies, which is a creative fiction work that Derek Bell, the legal scholar, one of the um, founding scholars of critical race theory, um, of interest convergence, and truly an activist of his time that has transformed our world around racial, legal, justice issues. Um, and he was also an artist, uh, a deep creative thinker that used creative works um, and creative storytelling to really talk about real, everyday issues around racism. And in particular, afro Atlantica has a book um, was specifically about an island where only black people could breathe. And it was a place that no scientist or anyone in the world of any government actually knew about. And it was a place that African Americans in particular wanted to expatriate to because racism was so overwhelming in the US. And once they got closer to the island when they thought they were going to leave the US, it actually disappeared right in front of them. And the lesson in it was to find a way to unify together and to figure out how to live in a world that will not transform racism, but to build community within it in order to better learn how to survive together. So I just want to honor Derek Bell on that um, as we open up. Uh, this is the cover of the catalog, and then I will jump into my talk, which the slides, I'm really excited. Yay. And also, the catalog is available online. Um, so, yay. Um, perfect. OK, so yeah. Shout out to Eric Bell. <laughs> um, but yeah, so to start, um, this particular talk is related, of course, to the context of the art. But I did want to be clear that it is also an indictment of just the world that we currently live in around anti-blackness and what it means to be black in a world where you can't be free. So, on Deadly Imaginations and Disappeared Archives. I wanted to start off with a poem by Lucille Clifton, um, who also really inspired this work, who I believe was a death worker in her art. I am accused of tending to the past, as if I made it, as if I sculpted it, with my own hands. I did not. This past was waiting for me. When I came, a monstrous unnamed baby, and I, with my mother's itch, took it to breast and named it history. She is more human now, learning languages every day, remembering faces, names, and dates, 
When she is strong enough to travel on her own, beware, she will. So, um, in the context of studying the research and the history in Virginia in particular around fugitivity, um, I found that with no archive, there is no future. And so my research really left me more lost than found when looking for fugitive stories, mainly because the archive is incomplete, it's insufficient, and it is completely skewed by anti-blackness and white supremacy. And so the missing pieces of so many black people who ran, who stayed, who suffered in silence and revenge, who flew, who killed, who disappeared without a trace, who erased their own history to ensure that they could never be captured, and who will never be known because everyone they knew was unknown too, or completely disappeared. And so I want to name that in studying the research around what is available of fugitive slaves, so much of our own fugitivity is disappeared on purpose in order to ensure that those could remain fugitive. Um, but also that many slave narratives are always transcribed or translated through either non-black people, white people, slave owners, or those who were always a party or had the opportunity to read or write next to black people. So fugitive slaves have no geography. Um, so not only is there not a place to run, but there's no place to leave behind any evidence, any breadcrumbs, <coughs> any history. Their history cannot be traced because it is purposely hidden, puppeteered, obscured, stolen, or lost. So what I needed to do in this project um, that I found to be completely different than what my intentions were, were to apply necessary speculation. And so in that capacity, I had to realize that there were no faces that I could look at of most fugitive slaves, that only I could refer to runaway slave advertisements. There were no maps I could look at about the roads that they took or the places that they would hide or the dead trees that they would find life in, but just the absence of a slave on the plantation. Just the remembrance of white people wondering where their slave went, where their property went, and that was the only evidence for fugitivity. Not their actual story, not their name, not where they went, not what they wanted to be, not who they were. Some firsthand accounts, but mostly stories from the perspectives of white people and slave owners. Um, so often it was just missing property, right? Uh, an outlawed Negro, but not who they were, not why they ran, and not even the context or the circumstances of how they were dying or suffering. And so there were no motives, only punishments. I often was led to legal consequences and court documents that would prove the ways in which that slaves were being fugitive, how they would respond, how they would enact crimes that really were not actually harms um, in a world that was already violating them, but was just a response to a world that was killing them. And so it was only ever the lynchings or the executions that would lead me to knowing that someone was a fugitive in their actions, and it was never what led them there how they were hurt, or where they wanted to go. And so there was no history and only conjecture. And so what I had to do was make up the pieces of these, pe of these folks' lives, of their faces, of their stories, of maybe why they decided to react the way that they did. Um, but in so much of that, the project itself could only go as far as I could. So where there is no archive, we are left with the never-ending questions. Why are black people hunted like this? And what makes killing black people so necessary? And where can black people run? So to develop the art on fugitivity, the requirement is fantasy as much as it is historical excavation. Um, so where there is no evidence, I can only take the work as far as my own deadly imagination, which meant that I had to endure thinking about what it would be like in a life or death situation, which to some degree I already know as a black person, um, as a fat person, as a queer person, as a disabled person, but what I also had to really truly think about was, if I were in these circumstances, what would I do to get free? And what means would I take? And if I had no other alternative, what would that look like? And what would bring me there? What would it look like to kill someone who wanted to kill me? So throughout Afro-Atlantica, I had to imagine violence I've never seen, but could only infer from research. And I had to shift my own ethics to create the visual stories of those who did anything to be free. This, for example, is called No Crackers at All, um, after a Mary Baraka's poem, and so, who will survive America? And this, is, this person isn't real, right? They are actually a collective experience of so many people who poison white babies as a form of survival. 
So I want to be really clear, right, because this is very visceral, and I find that this actually becomes the point of departure in most black study scholarship, but that it is not about trying to reflect white death as a as an equal to what is happening in anti-blackness, right? Or that seemingly this would be the caveat to the world that we have now survived and now we're in the afterlife of slavery. So seeing white death or harm to white people would seemingly be the equal response to what has happened. There is no equal to oppression, right? Oppression doesn't operate in equals. It operates in a huge disadvantage that means that you are either human or you're not, right? And so in this capacity, I wanted to illuminate why there was such a precedent in Virginia, particularly around poison in slaves. Virginia set the precedent on creating a law where slaves could not have possession or access to poison because there were so many poisonings happening to masters, mistresses, and their children, and to white people collectively. Um, and to the point that even still, people would still invite slaves back into their home around their food and around their children, even when they were poisoned. So here I just wanted to show this Venn diagram, which I think really illuminates my ethic and understanding of how, what it means to be black and the violence of anti-blackness and what we have to do in lieu of not having an archive and having to use fantasy where history doesn't exist. So here we have absolute knowing and absolutely confirmed, right? Absolute knowing includes black intergenerational memory. So what we share traditionally, oral traditions, our experiences, our cultures, what we experience in our ethnicities and the pockets where we get to be black with other black people and what they've survived, what I've survived and how that all collectively creates a communal knowledge, right? So it also creates a generational memory that lives within us just as much as trauma does. And so what's absolutely confirmed is slave archives, right? Which we know are inefficient and we know are not, we know are actually skewed as well, right? But if we're looking at historical accuracy, that is what we would consider to be absolutely confirmed, right? Where there is citation, where there is knowledge production, affirmation by the system, by the state. And so right there in the middle of the overlap is deadly imagination, which is what it means to be black, is to fill in the space for what we don't know and what cannot be confirmed, but we need so that we can be able to survive this world. Where there was no stories of fugitivity, where there, no, where there were no faces, that is where I am right in the middle. Using deadly imagination to have to create these people from scratch, or just from little pieces of their life, or just their survival, or their killing spree, right? So I'm looking at blood, and I'm making a person, and that in and of itself is the most violent reality of anti-blackness. So our imaginations become deadlier every second we exist here, and we are constantly inventing what we cannot cite and what we cannot find evidence for while trying to make sense of how we're dying. So our dying must have meaning, it must have a source, it must have a dialectic, it must have bounds so that we can understand it. But because without evidence and without logic and without purpose, we cannot escape what has no blueprint, no exit door, and no end in sight. And that in and of itself is the conundrum of being black, trying to figure out how to stop being black if being black means being dead. So we imagine the worst experiences of anti-blackness and we will fail because the violence is in believing anti-blackness has boundaries and it doesn't, right? So even when we think of the worst instance of what has happened to black people in this country, in this world, or the people in our lives who we know have survived violences and harms that are far beyond our own understanding, or if we were the ones that actually set the bar in our own lives where it's something deeply violent has happened to us and everybody else gleans from it because now they get to see it. But at the end of the day, we know that that's actually not the end of anti-blackness. The most violent part about it is that it's everywhere at all times. So we fantasize and we study, we mythologize and we dialogue and we search, and we jump off the ship into conclusions. And so we create our history with imagination and archives all at once. And who can contest this, right? The question would become, well, who would push back on what we can't necessarily prove? And are we ever wrong? There are so many instances historically where we've used mythology where it's not sufficient, but it somehow became necessary for something, right? When we look at Farrakhan using the story of Willie Lynch at the Million Man March, we have to question why. There were so many archives that prove that slave management had its own violences. We don't need an imaginary figure like Willie Lynch to fill in the blanks. 
yet it became so necessary to create a Willie Lynch syndrome to talk to other black people about how they were failing other black people, how they were internalizing identity politics and capitalism, and how they were looking at other black people as their enemy. But why do we need Willie Lynch to do that? So even if it's not real, we can find other forms of citation. It's the captivating part that actually keeps black people caught in it because it serves a purpose for some reason. So because anything we imagine will never actually amount to the material violence that occurred, we really can't be wrong. We really can't contest it. Because even if Willie Lynch didn't exist, we know that there is a white person who was just like Willie Lynch who couldn't wait to kill black people, right? Who couldn't wait to make a mockery out of them and use them as a social experiment about how you can actually make people feel less than amongst each other and then create a hierarchy out of it. Watch them, right? We can see the same thing when we even like juxtapose this to a panopticon of Foucault, right? So when we watch prisons and we watch people in surveillance and, voyeur and become voyeurs to them, we can see that people actually find power in that. We don't need Willie Lynch because there's another Willie Lynch. So because anti-blackness has no bounds, and our imaginations do, this is how I think the limitation does become real for us when we realize that actually we can never actually imagine the worst part of it, but we're still never wrong. And so is the violence who we must become here as black people? Is the violence and the fantastical that we create because anti-blackness is already a nightmare? Or is the violence the fact that there will never be enough evidence to prove otherwise? That every story we tell, every painting that I've painted, you will never know what is actually real. Because you can't tell me this isn't a real person who actually killed her baby. Because she couldn't imagine her child living in slavery. Because even though she may not be Margaret Garner, she was someone else. Right? There are so many stories in Virginia, Lucy, Mary, who took their child and buried them because they did not want them to be slaves. So the most violent part of anti-blackness is that we will never know what is a captivating story and what is a historical facet of black captivity. So the black conscious desire to fill disappeared archives with deadly imagination is only indicative of how ubiquitous anti-blackness is and that true violence is the ecosystem that curates an imaginative psychosis that black people have to live in. And what black people do to survive the mythology of white supremacy is only a symptom. Thank you.
So I think we'll say goodbye. Thanks to all our folks online. And please do come experience the exhibit firsthand at our space in downtown Charlottesville. Thanks, everybody.